So today I want to talk about one of the most fundamental concepts in signal processing, which is sampling. Okay. So what I'm mainly going to talk about today is the kind of classical sampling theorem. Just as a reminder for how that all works. And the setup is that, you know, we're kind of used to thinking about the difference between continuous time signals and discrete time signals, right? So a continuous time signal, which we might also think of as an analog signal, is a function of t. And the assumption here is that I can choose any real number t I want here and get back any signal value that I want, right? However, in the kind of digital signal processing world, we have to deal with an approximation to this underlying continuous time signal. And the way we do that is with a discrete time or digital signal. where I get only certain values of the signal and presumably at regular you know, units, right? So for example, MATLAB assumes that these units are spaced out by one unit on the axis, right? So if, if you don't tell MATLAB anything else, it thinks that you're looking at x of 1, x of 2, x of 3, and so on, OK? So the process of going from a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal is called sampling. Okay, And that's the main topic of today. There's a separate issue. So sampling is, is definitely like kind of an x-axis issue, a time domain axis issue. There's also an issue on the y-axis called quantization, right? So we'll talk about that very briefly today. We may talk about it later on in future classes. But the idea also is that I may not necessarily get kind of infinite resolution in the heights that these signal values can be. It could be that I'm also limited by you know, some sort of a chopped up version of the y-axis and I have to round myself to the nearest thing. And that's called quantization, right? So both of those things are kind of ways of thinking about digitizing either the domain or the range of a signal, okay? And so most of the time we think about what we call periodic sampling, okay? So periodic sampling. is simply saying that I obtain a discrete time signal by sampling a continuous time signal every capital T units. So n is an integer, and this capital T is called the sampling period, and 2 pi over t, which I sometimes call omega s, is called the sampling frequency. And just as a side note, you know, this sampling frequency is measured in what's called radians, right? That is kind of, you know, where you've got the pi's involved, right? If you wanted to talk about hertz, you could just look at 1 over t. So the sampling frequency in hertz is just the reciprocal. And pretty much all the time in this class, we're going to talk about radians, because that's where the mathematics is, is more natural. OK. And so sometimes this process of obtaining the discrete time signal from the continuous time signal is called D to A conversion. And going backwards, it's called A to D conversion. Right? So for example, I might take a continuous time signal. I might feed it into a analog to digital converter, or sometimes you see it called the continuous to discrete converter. One of the inputs to that is the sampling period, and what comes out is this discrete time signal. OK. And so before I start talking about the sampling theorem, let me just mention that in the real world, there are often some non-ideal effects that we can still model with the machinery that we've learned so far, right? So for example, um, it's not necessarily always true that my sampler you know, takes a continuous time signal and ideally just picks off one value, right? So this is my continuous time signal. Ideally, what I want is getting like exactly this value, right? What I may actually get instead is basically, say, the average signal over a very, very short 
time period, right? So I mean, it may not be physically possible for the for the sampler to pick off one value. It maybe picks off you know the average of you know a fraction of a millisecond of values, for example. Okay, and so in that case, kind of what we're getting is you know um, so non-ideal effects. So one is we may not ideally sample this continuous time signal, we may instead sample some signal that is convolved with some kind of tiny impulse response. So this is kind of like the impulse response of the sampler. Right, so instead we may get samples of this slightly kind of blurred out signal, right? But again, knowing that, you know, knowing that we know how to handle convolved signals, that's not really a big issue for this. I'm, I'm kind of just going to assume going forward that we do get the ideal samples, but you could analyze these slightly blurry samples in this way, okay? The other non-ideal effect is that we may have noise. which means that instead of getting exactly this value, I may get you know, this value instead, right? So just due to noise in the system, I might not get exactly what I asked for, right? And so kind of what this means is that my discrete time signal may be some sort of a, you know, um, so if I let this thing equal y of t, right, this whole thing here, what I may be getting is, you know, a sampled, version of a blurry signal plus some sort of a, you know, noise term that I can't control. Okay, so, you know, life is not always so ideal, but in this case we're going to assume everything is good. Okay. Okay, so it's kind of straightforward about how do we do the sampling, right? I, I design my thing that picks off the values. The thing that's of interest to us in this class right now is how would I go back from the digital values to the continuous time signal, right? Because, you know, the whole hypothesis here is that we can use DSP and stuff that we do in MATLAB and chips as a substitute for the ideal continuous time processing of more continuous time signals, right? And so to do that, we have to kind of have some confidence that the digital signals adequately represent the continuous time signal, okay? And so kind of a central topic is reconstruction. So. So basically, how to, um, you know, how to recreate, or maybe a better way to say it would be estimate, uh, the continuous time signal given the discrete time samples. Okay. And so clearly, that's kind of a many to one, or one to many kind of problem, right? So I mean, if I give you some samples, there are lots of ways that I could hypothesize a continuous time signal that went through those samples, right? This is kind of like an interpolation problem. So I mean, I could do something really simple, like just connect these guys with lines. Oops, kind of a crummy picture there. Or I could, you know, kind of like try and make these into bars, like a bar graph. Or I could even make some sort of like, you know, crazy signal that could do basically anything in between the samples, right? And so just from the samples alone, there's no way to disambiguate which of these cases I might be in, right? And that's the fundamental kind of challenge of the sampling theorem is, you know, what is the signal that we want to reconstruct from a given set of samples, okay? So let me just say a couple words. So certainly there's this sense that if I had sampled the signal fast enough, then connecting the dots or making this bar graph maybe is good enough, right? And so, you know, some simple estimates have names, right? So, you know, one is basically, so I'm going to kind of draw the same uh, signal in three different ways here. <coughs> 
Okay. So one kind of natural thing is the nearest neighbor, right? So nearest neighbor basically says, you know, if I want to fill in the time, you know, gaps that I have, well, I should just take the closest sample that I saw of the discrete world, right? So that would mean that I would have kind of like a bar graph that says, okay, you know, all these samples are closest to this guy. Then I have a jump, and all these samples are closest to this guy, and so on, right? So this is called nearest neighbor interpolation. Um, this is, you know, maybe not entirely palatable because, for example, for some of these signals, right? So for these signals over here, I actually actually have to look into the future to find out where the nearest sample is, right? So I have this kind of half sample offset that's not causal. And so the natural modification of that is just to say, okay, you know, to reconstruct the signal, I just use the most recent value that I saw, right? So I, I basically just hold on to this, and when I see a new signal, I hop up to the new value, right? So this is like basically the nearest neighbor, but offset by half a sample, and this is called zero order hold. And, you know, then you can start to think about, okay, well, I could do better by, instead of just kind of like having these stair steppy functions, by connecting the dots, right? So connecting the dots gives me perhaps a slightly better approximation. And this is called first order hold. And is also called linear interpolation. Right, and so for those of you that have done like your graphics and stuff like that, you know that there are even higher order things I could do, right? So for example, if you've heard of a cubic spline, that's what people in computer graphics use to connect up the discrete points that you have that define the surface of a 3D mesh into a smoother looking continuous surface, right? And so in that case, it's really like a cubic polynomial that goes through, you know, points. And so in order to make that cubic spline, I'm not just using my nearest neighbors, I'm using multiple neighbors that are further away from me, right? So you can kind of make smoother and smoother interpolations if you're willing to consider more and more of your neighbors, is what it comes down to. Okay, so I pause and ask any questions on these guys so far. All right, so one thing that's kind of interesting to think about, and that plays into the way that we talk about the sampling theorem, is that each of these reconstructions you can think of as taking the original samples and convolving them with some special kind of baseline, like a kernel. Okay, and so what I mean by that is, you know, let's think about um, let's think about this guy for a second, zero order hold, right? So what I can do, and here what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this guy instead of dots as delta functions. Okay, and this is kind of the <coughs> This is kind of the critical thing that lets us convert between digital and continuous, right? So the idea is that, you know, in MATLAB I have this continuous time set of, you know, uh, stick figures, these stem plots, right? To think about analyzing that in a more principled way, we think about the relationship between those samples and delta functions in continuous time that just happen to fire at those sample locations and have the same heights, okay? And so if I was to take this thing, and I was to convolve it, right? So if I think about this as a function of t, and if I think about convolving that with this function here, so here I'm going to kind of like label these guys, right? This is like, actually I should, I should be more proper. If I think about these as being every capital T interval, so here I should be really explicit about the sampling frequency, right? So forget about these guys, right? So this is like saying, if I take a little pulse that is, you know, capital T units wide, and I convolve it with this, I am going to produce exactly this picture, right? And so in some sense, this zero order hold is a reconstruction that I obtain by taking my original samples and convolving them with this special kind of baseline simple signal. And I can think about each of these guys in a similar way, right? So here, you know, this thing in a similar way is what I would have gotten if I had taken these same delta functions and here instead convolved it with, again, you're thinking about, one way to think about this is kind of like a 
impulse response of the filter that does the reconstruction, right? And so here, like I told you earlier, we like the zero order hold because it's causal, right? That means that this impulse response shouldn't have any values that are on the negative side of the t-axis, right? Whereas here, I know this is not causal. It means I'm looking a half a unit back into the past. And so here, the corresponding uh, guy here is this pulse shifted by, you know, t over 2, right? This one is a little harder to visualize. So what this guy has to do is take into account both of my, but let's take into account, you know, here, this guy has to look this direction and this direction of both of these samples, right? And so it turns out that the corresponding signal for the kind of impulse response of the sampler looks like this. And you can kind of convince yourself why that's true. So the idea is, for example, let's suppose that I, you know, place that triangle, um, you know, when I place a triangle right on top of one of these delta functions, I get exactly that guy, because there's no overlap between the triangle and any other function. When I move the triangle a little bit over, that's like saying, okay, I get, you know, uh, I guess I kind of made this diagram a little hard to understand. Let me kind of zoom in here. Right, so suppose I have this guy and this guy. When I move the triangle over kind of halfway, that's like saying that uh, the triangle is normally this wide. If I move it over kind of half a unit, that's like saying that I'm taking, you know, half of this sample plus half of that sample. And if I move it over even further, that's like saying I take, you know, like a quarter of this sample plus three quarters of that sample until finally the triangle is on top of the next impulse, right? So you can kind of see that the triangle is always going to weight the two adjacent samples in terms that add up to one, right? So I'm always taking alpha plus one sample plus one minus alpha times the other sample. Okay. And so you can imagine that more and more fancy interpolation methods involve kind of more and more complicated, um, you know, reconstruction impulse responses, right? And so the preview, right, is that the actual true correct interpolation impulse response is going to be a sync function in the uh, time domain, right? Which is going to correspond to a pulse in the frequency domain. So we're going to show why that works in just a second. But the idea is basically that all we're doing is we're choosing kind of like the correct thing to convolve the time domain impulses with to get the reconstructed signal. Okay. So now I want to talk about, you know, reconstruction, right? Perfect reconstruction is our goal. We would love to be able to take our original samples and get back exactly the original time domain signal, right? And so it kind of seems like, okay, well, let's suppose that I have even just like a sinusoid, right? So let's suppose I have like a, a sinusoid and I sample it like super finely, okay? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, you know, this looks pretty good, right? I mean, in fact, it seems like a pretty credible argument that if these samples were close enough together, then connecting the dots should get me pretty close to the original signal, right? If they were like super close together, then, you know, maybe sure I wouldn't get exactly the same signal, but I would get something that was pretty close, right? Um, and so that's true. And what I'm gonna call this is kind of like the good case, right? So life is good here that you know, if the samples were close enough together, there wouldn't be any real ambiguity about what the underlying signal was, right? Okay, but the problem is that there's also kind of a bad case, okay? And here this is gonna kind of tax my drawing powers, but I'm gonna show you a MATLAB example in a second. Okay, so let's suppose that I have a really high frequency sinusoid, and I sample it like every you know, once in a while. I'm not sure this is like the best picture that I ever drew. Let me try and draw the bad case a little bit, a little bit worse. All right, so again, we have a high frequency 
side to side. Let's sample like really far apart. This is more like it. Okay, so I get this sample, get this sample, get this sample. Okay, and now if I was kind of to naively connect the dots, this is where the crappy quality of my drawing will, will suffer. So, you know, my connecting of the dots might give me some sort of a weird signal that appears to have lower frequency than the underlying sinusoid, right? I wouldn't be able to capture all the wiggliness that's going on between the dots. I'm going to show you an actual example of this in MATLAB that is actually a lot better than this. Actually, why, instead of just promising that I'm going to do it, why don't I just do it? Okay, so, for example, here is a uh, tiny sinusoid, right? And so here what I've done is I'm showing you different possibilities for what the reconstruction looks like. So the blue is the original signal, the green is the reconstructed signal under different circumstances, right? And so here, the green is simply the um, zero order hold, meaning that I hold the sample that I was on. You can see that I get kind of a crummy reconstruction. Um, here is something, you know, that I would get if I try to connect the dots, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive about this, right? So here's an example where, try to get one where I can show you the, oh, I, I, let's see here. Yeah, here we go, right? So here's a case where I'm sampling too slow, right? And the green samples are hitting the blue sinusoid, you know, at the correct places, but when I kind of connect the dots, what I get is this appearingly low frequency sinusoid, right? And that's exactly the problem, right? Is that without knowing anything about the underlying signal, there's no way for me to tell a priori, am I in the good case where it appears the samples are really close together, or the bad case when the samples are really far apart, right? The problem is I don't know anything about what's happening between the samples, right? And so if I were to go back to my kind of sketch, you might say, oh, okay, well, you know, let's suppose that I got my samples and they look like this. The problem is that, you know, if I were to zoom and enhance this picture, right, it could be that, you know, then in between, like, this region, then it might look like my samples are comparatively far apart. And who knows what this signal could be doing. You know, it could be oscillating wildly in between the samples that I have, right? So the problem is that I don't know without putting more restrictions on the problem, am I in the good case or am I in the bad case? And so the only way out of this problem is to put some restrictions on the input signal to say, I am not going to tolerate any crazy wiggling between my samples, right? That means I have to kind of say that my input signal is restricted in some way, okay? And that's what the band-limited assumption is we're going to talk about in a second. So let me, let me pause to ask for a second just on the big picture. Does this make sense? Okay. So, okay. So here's the assumption that makes everything kind of come together. And that is the following. So we're going to say a signal is band limited if there's some frequency omega b such that the continuous time Fourier transform is zero for omega you know, outside this interval, right? That means that my continuous time Fourier transform looks something like this, okay? So between minus omega b and omega b, I have some content. Outside of that range, I have nothing, okay? And so again, in all the stuff I'm going to draw right now, the reason that I'm kind of drawing these the signals is approximately symmetric is because I assume that I have an approximately real signal. And what I'm kind of drawing here is something like, you know, the magnitude of the continuous time Fourier transform. We know that there are these symmetries in the Fourier transform that mean that these are actually complex numbers. So here, I'm just kind of getting across the sketch of the picture, okay? Okay, and so let's talk about um, 
what happens when I sample a signal that looks like this. Okay, and this is the famous sampling theorem. Okay, so so famous it gets its own sheet. Okay, so this was basically you know attributed widely to Shannon, Claude Shannon, father of information theory, and also Nyquist, who talked about this idea even earlier than that. Okay, and so here's the theorem: a band-limited signal with maximum frequency. Omega B can be perfectly reconstructed from samples. I'm going to say from evenly spaced samples if the sampling frequency. Omega S satisfies Omega S greater than two Omega B. Okay, and uh, two Omega B is called the Nyquist straight. So another way of saying this is that a signal could be reconstructed for samples if I sample above the Nyquist rate. Okay, and the Nyquist rate is related to the highest frequency present in the underlying signal. Okay, and so let's prove why this is true. Number one, we're going to prove why it's true, and number two, we're going to show explicitly how that reconstruction could be obtained. Okay, and let me just make a note that you have to sample faster than the Nyquist rate. Like you can't sample at the Nyquist rate. That is sometimes good enough, but sometimes will not do it for you. Okay, and I'll show you an example of why sometimes sampling at the Nyquist rate could be bad. Okay, um, so the, the key idea is you have to sample greater than the Nyquist rate. This is a common kind of uh, what's the word? You know, tricky, true/false kind of test question where I ask you, you know, could I sample this? Would it work? Kind of thing. Okay, and so now we have to kind of think back for a second to. Uh, some of the stuff we talked about when we did the Fourier transform long ago. So, kind of the key idea is that what I need to do is I have a continuous time signal, right? So here's my underlying continuous time signal, and here's my discrete time signal, which is basically sampling this guy every T units. And so, kind of my proxy for this uh, discrete time signal is going to be a signal where I multiply the continuous time signal by a set of delta functions, right? So if I were to multiply um, this thing, and here I mean multiply, not convolution in the time domain, if I just multiply this by this set of impulse functions that are separated out by capital T and they have height 1, the effect of multiplying this by this is simply to pick off the values that I want. Right? So kind of what I'm doing is I'm making kind of a proxy continuous time signal that clearly is basically the same as my discrete time signal, just with uh, delta function arrows replacing my stem plot dots, okay? So kind of what I'm going to talk about is, okay, so how could I get from this signal back to this signal, okay? And again, in this form, this kind of brings it back to the sketch I drew earlier of I'm ultimately going to convolve this time domain signal with some special, you know, reconstruction filter that's going to get me back to here, okay? All right. So in order to, to do this, what I have is that my, you know, let me call this kind of uh, D of T. So what I have is that my sampled signal is like my continuous signal times this 
impulse train, right? And so in order to think about these things in the frequency domain, I need to know what is the Fourier transform of this, right? Because here, what I'm doing is multiplying in the time domain. That means I'm involving the original signal in the frequency domain with whatever the Fourier transform of this is, right? And so as a reminder, if you look back in your notes or videos, um, if I have this in my time domain, Man, this is not good. I'm lecturing while hungry. Should have had another donut. OK, so this is the time domain. What is the frequency domain version of this? And remember, again, everything here is in continuous time, right? So this is a infinitely long extending impulse train in time. And this omega axis goes off infinitely far, too. So we showed earlier that the Fourier transform of this is actually another impulse train in the frequency domain, and it corresponds to impulses that look like this. So the height of the impulses is 2 pi over t, which is actually the same as the sampling frequency. And the separation between the impulses is every 2 pi over t units. Or you can think about these as basically multiples of the sampling frequency. Okay, So again, I'm not going to prove this, because if you look back in your notes, I think we proved this earlier. Actually, just as a, as a reference, the way you get to here is by thinking about this. So this is like a periodic continuous time signal. And it's easy to show that you know if you think about this in terms of what is the Fourier series of this thing, it's a constant, right? Because I know that delta functions correspond to constants. And we showed that basically when I have a periodic signal, I take the regular Fourier transform of it, what I get is basically um, you know, multiples. What I basically get is that this is like the A0 coefficient. This is like the A1 coefficient. This is like the A2 coefficient, right? These are the Fourier series coefficients multiplied by something, which turns out to be the 2 pi over t. And they occur at multiples of the sampling frequency, right? So if you go back and look at your notes on the Fourier transform of a, con of a periodic continuous function, this is not too hard to prove. OK. So let's take a step back now. So this is our assumption that this is true. Okay. Now, what I have is that my sample continuous time signal is my underlying continuous time signal multiplied by this impulse train. So in the frequency domain, I know that this corresponds to a convolution. And this is the corresponding property. You may not remember that there's a 2 pi there, but that's all right. And so let's think about what that looks like, OK? Well, um, what I kind of just showed was that if I'm being all mathematical about this, right? what I just showed was that this delta function thing here was, I'm going to write this like 2 pi over t times the sum from uh, k equals minus infinity to infinity of delta functions that are spaced out every multiple of the sampling frequency. Okay. And so I can see some cancellations, right? So this 2 pi cancels with this 2 pi. And what happens when I convolve a signal with a delta function? Well, it just shifts the signal, right? So this is like saying that I'm going to get a bunch of copies of the original signal at all the places where the delta function fires, right? This is like basically saying I'm going to get a whole bunch of periodic copies of the original thing. So let's kind of sketch out as a picture what that means. Whoops, I knocked my thing here. Back. OK. So let's interpret this, right? This is like saying, OK, let's suppose that I have my original signal. And as we're trying to prove the Nyquist theorem, I'm going to assume that this signal is band limited between minus omega b and b. And actually, to maybe give myself a little more room, maybe I should make that a little bit smaller on the page. So I'm going to say, like, between here and here. OK, so here's my original spectrum of the continuous time signal. So what does this result tell me? This tells me I'm going to get 
a whole bunch of copies of that guy. They're going to be 1 over t as high as they used to be, and they're going to occur at multiples of the sampling frequency. So if this guy originally had height 1, my sampled spectrum is going to look like, let's suppose that I sampled like here, and here's my other multiple, like this. And here's my first copy. The first copy is centered at zero, because that's definitely an example of a multiple of the sampling frequency. My second copy is over here. My third copy is over here, and so on. And again, all these guys are going to have height 1 over t. And so the band, so this goes out to WB. This goes out to omega s minus omega b. This is omega s plus omega b, and so on. OK. And so this picture is really all I need to help me prove the sampling theorem, right? Because if this is the spectrum of my sampled signal, it's pretty obvious that all I need to do is to notch out this middle guy. So all I need is a filter that kind of crops out the middle guy and multiplies it by t in the frequency domain. Then I get back exactly this guy, right? So all I need to do is low pass filter the sampled signal to get back the original signal, right? And you can see in this picture why the Nyquist rate is what it is, right? Because what I need is to make sure that this copy here doesn't overlap with this copy here, right? So the good case is when, you know, the good case is when this number is strictly greater than this number, right? That means that things don't overlap, and that's exactly the statement of the sampling theorem, right? That means that this edge and this edge stay away from each other, right? It's maybe not super clear from the picture why it would be a problem if they were right on top of each other. I'm going to show you an example of that in just a second. But this is definitely the good case. And, my, and conversely, the bad case is when I have copies that are overlapping. So yeah, the bad case is that I sample too slowly. Too slow. And so that's like saying that, OK, here is my sampling frequency. Here is my band limit. And here, this number here, you know, when I look at this combination of signals, unfortunately, these signals have overlapped in a way that I can't undo. So this is going to be minus omega s, yeah, plus omega b, right? And so this bad juju over here is aliasing, right? So that means that if I sample too slowly, I kind of garble up high frequencies of the original signal, and they get mixed up with lower frequencies of the lower copy in the frequency domain. And once I've added this stuff together, there's really nothing I can do to recover it. Okay, So that's not good. Um, so that's kind of the idea is that you know high frequency components appear as low frequency, or maybe they appear they combine with low frequency components from a different copy. So we don't want to be in that case, right? That means that we have to be careful to sample fast enough, OK? So assuming that we do sample fast enough, that we're in the good case, right, this case, then all we need to do to reconstruct things is to take this signal and multiply it by some nice reconstruction filter. So I would call my reconstruction filter something like this where I'd say, OK, I'm going to notch this guy out. I'm going to multiply you know, the gain in the frequency domain is this capital T. I'm going to call this my reconstruction filter. And 
I can choose this reconstruction filter to kind of be as wide as I want as long as I don't hit any of the you know edges. A safe choice, if I've done it right, should be basically you know half the sampling frequency. In general, you know, this would be like some cutoff, but you know, here I'm going to choose this particular case, right? That means I'm going to just notch out this. So when I multiply in the frequency domain, you know, this thing <coughs> times this thing, what I should get is exactly my original. So I'm going to call this like x reconstructed of omega. Again, I'm going to get back the right height in the frequency domain. And you know this is exactly equal to the original time domain, or the original signal, right? And so life is good. And this is why we can see, right? So basically what I'm doing is I'm multiplying by a pulse in the frequency domain, right? Low pass filtering, basically. What is going on in the time domain? Well, I know that a pulse in, the time, pulse in one domain corresponds to a sink in the other domain. And so if I were to go back and think about what's being convolved with the original signal, right? So that's like saying, if I have my original signal, you know, what am I convolving it with to get back my continuous time signal? Well, this question mark is going to be some sort of a sink. And it turns out that, that sink looks like this. So the sink is got a special structure where it hits zero at every one of these places. It's one at zero. And so if I kind of carefully draw this, what it looks like is something like this. Right, so this is basically in the time domain. This looks like sync of pi t over capital T, right? Because at units of, at, at multiples of capital T, I have in the numerator a sine of some multiple of pi, which is always zero. And only at t equals zero might I have a problem. But we know the sync function at zero is equal to one, right? And so really, uh, in the time domain, putting it all together, what I could say is if I didn't want to go into the frequency domain, I could represent the reconstruction process as a convolution. So I could say, for example, that you know, x of t should be equal to this kind of sample version of t convolved with the reconstruction filter, which is a different way of saying something like, I'm going to get a sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity. These are my samples. And I'm going to have a convolution sum, which means that I'm going to have something like this, sync of pi t over like this. <coughs> so this is kind of like, you know, again, this may be a little bit confusing to look at. I haven't really changed anything. This is just like saying that all I'm doing is I am taking my sync function. And to create my output, what I'm doing is I am, I'm going to kind of draw this again a little bit spaced out. The output is actually the sum of a bunch of sync functions that happen to pass right on tops of these guys here. So that's kind of cool, I think. So what's happening is basically to reconstruct the output, what I'm doing is I'm centering this special sync function over every sample, and I'm adding those things up. And I can see that at each sample, the only sync function that's non-zero is the one that's sitting on top of the sample. right? So I'm adding a bunch of zeros plus the original sample. In between, to get like this value here, I'm adding a whole bunch of sync functions that magically add up to the right value. right? So that's kind of neat. Uh, I mean, the downside is that you can see that, in theory, to get any of these intermediate values, I have to include potentially an infinite number of sync functions, right? And so you could argue that, OK, well, what I could do is, after I've added up you know, 
50 sync functions on their side, the sync functions are going to be pretty small. So in practice, maybe I can kind of cut off those guys at some point. Okay. But that's the idea. Um, okay, so let me pause and ask, any questions about any part of this process? So hopefully that is not totally unfamiliar to you, right? Um, you should have seen it in signals. But you know, now hopefully we're thinking about things more in terms of, you know, now we know that the samples that we obtain, all the samples that we're going to use forward for digital signal processing, can be related back to the original continuous time samples under the assumption that we've sampled fast enough. And we're going to have to look in, in the next week of lectures to make sure that we never run into problems where we're sampling too slowly. Okay. So let's just do a quick um, kind of toy example. So let's suppose that we have a cosine. Okay, super simple. And I did not bring. Does anyone have a colored pen by a chance? Blue or red or something like that? It's like a trick from the audience. All right, thank you. All right. So here, what I want to do is just look at. A cosine, cosine omega zero t. Okay, and the reason I wanted the colored pen is we know that I have a pulse, you know, impulse here, and I have another one over here. So hopefully you can tell the difference between these colors. That's good. Okay, and so the sampling theorem tells me that. I need to reconstruct, if I want to reconstruct the signal, I have to sample faster than twice this frequency, right? There's only really one frequency present in the signal, and so, you know, that, that's pretty easy. So my sampled signal, right, um, so the, the spectrum, and I guess I should just pause and say, so spectrum, I guess I've said the word a few times, spectrum is the same kind of thing as looking at the Fourier transform, right? So the spectrum of a signal is its Fourier transform. So the spectrum of the sampled signal looks like, and here I'm going to kind of zoom out, so I'm going to assume that I'm sampling fast enough, and I have my middle copy, or my, I'm sorry, my right-hand copy here. This is like omega s plus omega zero. This is omega zero. This is a minus omega s plus omega zero. My other copies look like this. Right, so this is omega s minus omega zero, minus omega zero, minus omega s minus omega zero. Right, and so I can see that you know life is good. So suppose that my omega zero was equal to. Uh, all right, so now now let's think about the bad case. Okay, so let's suppose that um, I had a bad situation. So this is fast enough. So let's suppose I look at the spectrum of the sampled signal, you know, too slow. So for example, let's say that my omega zero is just one, and let's suppose I chose my sampling frequency to be three over two, right? And so I know by Nyquist that I should be sampling at least two to avoid any problems, right? So this is this is too slow. My my Nyquist rate is two. What does my picture look like? Well, now I can actually put some numbers on here. So if these are my unit axes. So here are my units. So my original guys are going to look like this, right? So here's my original. Uh, these are the original plus or minus omega zero. Now, if this is my sampling frequency omega s, that means I'm going to get a copy of the signal where I've got a copy over here and a copy over here, right? So this is basically at plus or minus at one or at three over two plus or minus one. And in the same way, I'm going to have a copy that comes from here where I'm going to get. Uh, this guy 
and this guy. Right? And so here I've seen exactly the aliasing problem, right? Because this number here, what used to be a high frequency, um, you know, basically the copy on the high end gets aliased down to over here. So it used to be something that should be a cosine at a high frequency now looks like cosine of one half t. So that's bad. Because what I would do if I didn't know better, right, is I would say my reconstruction filter, my reconstruction filter cutoff, if I chose omega s over 2, would be 3 over 4, right? That would mean that my filter would cut off like this, right? And if I were to just follow my nose and reconstruct, my reconstructed signal would be, you know, cosine of 1 half t, right? Not cosine of t. So this is an example of aliasing. Because the problem is that, you know, my, you know, D to A converter is just kind of assuming that everything is going according to plan, right? It doesn't know what signals are coming into it, right? And so if it's just using its standard, this, is, this should be my correct reconstruction filter, if I feed something in that was sampled too slow, it will give me back something that is not my original signal, right? And there's nothing that I can do about it. There's no way I can disambiguate uh, this signal coming in versus this signal coming in, right? Okay, so let's just do a quick thought experiment to think about, okay, well, what could go wrong if I sample at the Nyquist rate, right? I mean, so why can't I have the sampling frequency exactly equal to the Nyquist rate? So can we sample right at the Nyquist rate? Right, that's like saying that my omega s is exactly equal to twice the highest frequency. Well, let's think about a cosine again. So let's suppose that I have cosine of t, right? That means that my uh, omega band limit is 1. That means my sampling, fre my sampling frequency is 2, for example. So, OK, so let me draw my cosine. So this means that my sampling period is 2 pi over omega s, which is just 1, right? Uh, no, that means it's just pi. Sorry. So here's my cosine. And this is 2 pi, this is pi, this is minus pi, this is minus 2 pi. So that means that my samples are going to come here, 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 and so on. So this doesn't look so bad, right? This looks OK. Um, so, you know, what's the problem, right? So let's suppose instead that I look at sine t, right? Sine t has the same band limit, just like shifting this over. So if I have sine t, that means that instead I have this guy. And again, I'm going to sample every, so this is 2 pi, this is pi, this is 0, this is minus pi, and so on. So here again, if I sample this signal at exactly the Nyquist rate, I would get samples every pi units, right? And so my, my sampled signal would be identically zero, right? That's like saying that every time I fire the delta function, it just happens to hit the zero of the sine function, right? And so if I were to reconstruct that, there's no way to recon there's no way to disambiguate the reconstruct a signal from just being a constant zero, right? I get the same thing. And so this admittedly is kind of like a worst case scenario, but the problem is when you look at an input signal, you don't really know, you know, what combination of sines and cosines it is, right? I mean, admittedly, you could get lucky in this case, but you could also get unlucky in this case, right? So, you know, worst case scenario, you can't sample at the Nyquist rate. And an interesting thing that's kind of, um, you know, neat to think about is, in fact, you know, here's, a, here's an extreme case of the signal seeming to vanish when I sample. 
Another kind of interesting property is uh, phase reversal. And so basically we can show if my sampling frequency is less than twice the bandwidth. For example, if I have x of t being some cosine at this frequency, you can prove that the reconstructed signal is a cosine that number one is aliased, right? So I'm going to explain this in just a second, right? So what, what happened here? So first of all, we already knew kind of from this picture that, you know, what happens when things go wrong, right? When things go wrong, this number here is basically omega s minus omega b, right? So this tells me that when I sample too slow, the highest frequency appears to be omega s minus that, okay? And so that's exactly the same thing as this, right? So this is like saying, you know, uh, lower frequency, assuming that I sample too slow. And the fact that this is a plus phi and this is a minus phi means that I'm kind of going backwards. And kind of what I mean by that is that, let's suppose, here's an example, kind of a real world example. So, well, semi-real world. So let's suppose I've got a camera and I'm filming a wheel. And the wheel has a, you know, a, a stripe on it, okay? And so this thing is basically rotating, let's say, clockwise, right? Yes, okay. We have a discussion about which way is clockwise or clockwise, okay. Clockwise. Okay, so what happens if I, so the Nyquist rate tells me that I need to sample, you know, uh, quickly related to this wheel. What happens if I sample a little bit slowly? So suppose my omega zero, suppose that my sampling frequency is kind of, you know, between the frequency of the wheel and twice the frequency of the wheel. What kind of that, what that means is that I am sampling the wheel a little bit less than once every rotation, right? So the idea is that when the wheel rotates this way, I sample it again before it gets to the starting point, right? So I'm sampling it like less than once per rotation. So like this would be like my starting image. Then as it rotates around, I would sample this again here. And then as it goes around here, I would sample it again here and so on. And so according to the camera, it would look like the wheel was going that way, right? Because, you know, the line would appear to be going in the reverse direction. And this is exactly the phenomenon that when you look at old movies, it looks like the wagon wheels are going the wrong way. Or if you look at a car commercial, it looks like the wheels are going the wrong way. Or even your eyes can sometimes fool you like that because your eyes have an innate sampling frequency, right? And so this is exactly what's happening is that if your shutter does not sample fast enough and the wheel is going too fast, you can easily get these kinds of funky phase reversal things. So. True story. That's why. That's why that works. Okay. Okay. So let me just show you a couple examples of kind of real world signals, right? So here's a little GUI that I wrote again back when I was in grad school. So let's take a look at our old friend the dial tone. And so what I'm doing here is taking the signal, right? And so on the top back, on, the, on the top axis, you basically see the time domain signal, which is so this is a long signal, it's you know, densely sampled, it looks like a, a mess. Um, and then in the bottom, what I'm doing is I'm looking at both the original spectrum and the reconstructed spectrum. And so here, I have a little drop-down menu that tells me you know, what my you know, reconstructed method is. And so here, I can choose whether I want to do zero-order hold, uh, first-order hold, or sync interpolation. Okay? So I know that you know, sync interpolation is the ideal thing that I should be doing. Things like zero order hold and first order hold are kind of approximations. And so if I try and use them, I'm not going to get exactly the right thing back. And so here, what I'm doing is I'm comparing the original signal. So let me turn the volume up a little bit so that it may be audible on the, uh, on the recording. Try it again. Didn't seem to make much of a change. Let's see here. 
because I should really. All right, fantastic. So, I'm not sure there's anything else I can do here. So, I'm trying to turn this not way up. Right here. This appears to be all the way up, also. All right, so this may not be so successful on the uh, on the computer thing, but all right, so you guys can hear it at least. Okay, so what happens if I were to reconstruct with zero order hold and play the resulting signal? I get kind of like not quite the right thing, and the reason for that is that the zero order hold is not the ideal reconstruction. But here, let's think about this for a second. So my dial tone has component frequencies, and so let me just do a little back of the envelope calculation for a second. So dial tone turns out to have two pure tones at 350 hertz and 440 hertz. Right? This tells me that my Nyquist rate, my twice, so, so 440 is the highest frequency in the signal. That means that twice my Nyquist rate is 880 hertz, okay? So let's take a look at my little GUI. In my original GUI, I'm sampling at 10,000 hertz, right? So my, my blue signal is way, way oversampled, right? I know, I know I need to sample at at least, you know, 880 and I'm sampling at 10,000, right? Now here, what I have in this other little box is a factor of subsampling, right? This is like saying, suppose I take every 10th sample, right? If I do that, I'm still sampling at 10,000 over 10 is 1,000 hertz, right? And my Nyquist rate is 880, so that should be perfectly fine. And if I change my reconstructed method to sync interpolation, then indeed, when I reconstruct the signal, I get exactly the original signal, right? Because I'm sampling above the Nyquist rate. Everything is good. So let's think about this for a second. So if I take my 10,000 hertz and I divide by 10, I get a thousand, that's still good enough. If I take my 10,000 and I subsample by a factor of 11, that turns out to be 909, which is still above the Nyquist rate. And if I subsample by 12, then I get 833, right? So if I subsample by 11, should be good. If I subsample by 12, I should start to have problems. And I can kind of predict that what is the problem I'm going to have? The problem I'm going to have is that the 440 hertz sinusoid is going to alias into something that sounds like a lower tone. And I can predict that if this is my sampling rate and this is my bandwidth, that this thing will turn into something that is uh, math, 393 hertz. Right? So I expect that this higher tone thing is going to get shifted down to 393. And so let's, let's verify that that actually happens. So again, sum sample by a factor of 11. Life is still good. Subsample by a factor of 12. Now you can see that the blue and the green signals are no longer the same. When I play them, I get something that sounds more like the phone ringing, actually. And I can see why that's true by zooming in, right? So this is like saying that the, you know, if I look at these peaks, I can see that my lower frequency sinusoid, which was originally at 350, that didn't get damaged by anything because I was sampling fast enough for that sinusoid. So that nothing happened there. But the sample, the sinusoid that was at 440, got aliased down to this green peak that wasn't in the original signal. And that green peak is exactly where I said it would be, like roughly 400, which is actually 393 hertz, right? So the system works. And kind of I could do this with similar tones, right? So let's talk about the, the phone signal, for, the phone ringing for a second. So here, the phone ring, if I go back to my back of the envelope, so my phone ring has frequencies at 440 and 480, right? That means my Nyquist rate is 960. So again, that means that subsampling by a factor of you know, 10 should be fine. Subsampling even by a factor of 11 should get me in trouble because that's 909. And if I subsample by a factor of 12, that's 833. So again, if I only had this tone, my highest frequency would be 880. So sampling by t undersampling by 12 should probably alias both of the sinusoids, right? So again, let's see what happens there. So subsampling by 10, life is good. 
subsampling by 11, I should get one sinusoid get screwed up. Ooh, funky. Right, so again, I can zoom in on that and I can see that what's happened is one of the sinusoids looks okay, the blue higher one got alias down to the green lower one, and if I subsample by 12, then I should see that you know, both of the original things get dropped down to lower frequencies, and I get, you know, this is, this is the original, this is the reconstructed. So it's kind of like I'm taking the whole thing and moving it down by, you know, some number, right? Okay. And a more real world example is if I take, here's uh, original signal, right? So this is a CD quality sample. At, so CDs are sampled at about 44,000 hertz, right? And the reason for that is that the, well, there are a couple of there are a couple of reasons. One is certainly true, and one is kind of maybe apocryphal. So the the certainly true reason is that the human auditory system, right? It varies from person to person, but it, as a as a young person to whom CDs are marketed, your oh, CDs, huh? So your um, your ears are probably good to about you know 20,000 or a little bit more hertz, right? And so to make sure that you don't miss any of the high frequencies, we need to double that number, which comes out to about 44,000, right? The other apocryphal story is that the, so, that, so if you think about the, the why are CDs or why were CDs the size that they were, the story that went around was that the chairman of Sony who was involved with the CD standard was a big classical music fan and he wanted to make sure that he could fit the entire, whatever it was, Beethoven's Fifth or some famous symphony on one CD. So that was like, that, that dictated the number of minutes you needed and the sampling rate you needed and the other constraint was something about how they wanted the, uh, the diameter of the CD to be approximately the same as the, you know, corner to corner size of a cassette tape, which was the other standard at the time, right? So you can kind of compare them and see they're about the same size, right? So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the story. Um, and so what happens if I subsample them? So, so clearly here, the original signal has frequencies that are you know, the, again, looking at the blue part, you know, the frequencies go pretty high, right? They go certainly, again, this is this is going up in terms of hertz. They go well above, um, oops, I have to kind of get back to my, let me kind of get back to my thing here. So for example, they go well above 10,000 hertz, right? So I would need to sample really fast to not introduce any aliasing, but again, the, the higher frequencies don't have that much energy to them. And so if I were to, you know, let them wrap around to the low frequencies for a while, I wouldn't expect to hear too much distortion, right? So for example, here, if I subsample by like a factor of two, right? Here again, this is a good illustration. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see it on the video, is that the green signal necessarily is band limited by the sampling rate that I chose, right? So like I can't ever get a reconstructed signal that has higher frequencies than corresponding to the sampling rate, right? So here, the reconstructed signal, you know, it doesn't really sound that much different than the original. And the reason is that the aliased part is taking pretty low energy stuff and bringing it back into here. But the more that I create this thing, the more these signals are going to start to make the original signal sound distorted. So here, this is subsampling at a factor of four. So there are a couple things that you expect to hear. One is that you expect to hear kind of like a low-pass version of the signal, right? So you kind of remember from when we did the other demo with the music that low-pass filtering uh, an audio signal kind of takes out the, you know, symbols and the high-frequency sounds and so on. So even here, you know, you might not really notice an audible difference between the original signal and a low-pass filtered version of the original signal. But as I crank it up more, you definitely start to hear distortion. And, and that, that's manifested by looking at the time domain and seeing that the green and the blue signals start to visibly diverge from each other. And so here, this is eight times. And so here, not only do you get some low pass -y kind of thing, but you also start to get this kind of weird, like, crud that seems like it's not part of a low pass filtered signal, right? You can get this here, this weird shrieky kind of distortion. And as I get further, like, let's say I use 15, right? So now, not only am I kind of muddying up the signal, but clearly there's other stuff that's coming into the signal. And that's, that's all that high frequency stuff that's getting wrapped around. And so in this case, this is a situation where even though in my drawings, I made it look like 
the only thing that could happen was that the next adjacent copy overlapped into the middle copy. If I really sample way too slowly, it could be that I get frequency contributions coming from copies that are much further away. Right? So in this case, I'm probably wrapping around like four or five times into the part that I'm reconstructing. And so um, after I reconstruct, you know, after, after I take this to the, some extreme, you know, it doesn't sound like anything. It just sounds like, you know, weird distortion noise, right? And so, so there's kind of a, and we're going to talk about this in, um, you know, we're going to talk about this in a couple lectures, but one thing that you can do to kind of mitigate against this is to pre-filter the signal to definitely conform to the Nyquist rate before you do the sampling, right? So if you wanted to make sure that you didn't introduce this distortion, what I could do before I do the sampling is low-pass filter the signal to prevent any of those high frequencies from getting involved in the sampling. That would be kind of like saying, okay, let me go back to my MATLAB picture. So what I could do is I could say, okay, I know that, you know, I, I don't want this to happen, right? And so what I could do a priori is to say, I kind of know worst case of where this could be. I'm going to take my original signal. I'm going to pre-filter it by what I know the ideal reconstructed filter has to be. And I'm only, I'm only going to pass this thing within you know, the sampler. And that means that when I reconstruct, I get copies that, you know, worst case, line up ideally like this, but I don't get any aliasing, right? So I can kind of prevent aliasing by pre-filtering with the right bandwidth. And the last thing I want to say is just that now we can really fully draw the connections between continuous time and discrete time, which is kind of where I wanted to go from the very beginning, right? So let's let's revisit big picture, right? So big picture is that I want to know how to represent continuous time signals. And if you look at my little MATLAB demo, that's exactly what I'm doing here, right? I'm kind of saying that I have this underlying continuous time signal. How can I be drawing these axes that show me what's happening in, in continuous time hertz, right? Well, let's just be really clear about the conversion. So that's like saying I have some original signal. So this is like my original continuous time Fourier transform, right? Maybe that continuous time signal is band limited. Now, if I sample at some sampling frequency, what I get is copies of that signal centered at the sampling frequency. Now, this basically is saying that I assume that my input signal samples are spaced apart by capital T, right, the sampling period. If I think about that signal as a discrete time signal, like MATLAB, in MATLAB, those signals are going to be spaced apart by units of one, right? And so basically, this is like my DTFT, right? So if I have MATLAB, the corresponding Fourier transform in MATLAB, well, I know that DTFTs are 2 pi periodic, right? That means that I'm still going to get these periodic looking signals, but the copies always occur at multiples of 2 pi because I know that the signal is 2 pi periodic. And so kind of what I'm doing here is I'm taking the original signal and I'm modifying the frequency axis, right? So what used to be omega s becomes 2 pi. What used to be omega b becomes omega b times uh, 2 pi over omega s, right? Or a different way of saying this is t times omega b, okay? And then when I take the DTFT, as if I was using MATLAB, the DTF, or, I'm sorry, the DFT, the DFT samples would be like sampling this guy every 2 pi over n units. So these here are like DFT samples every 2 pi over capital N units, right? And so if I want to draw an approximation to the original Fourier transform of the original signal, and I took the DTFT and the DFT, if I want to know, for example, you know, what does sample N here correspond to in actual hertz, what would I do? Well, I would say that this sample here, you know, so sample N, 
corresponds to, well, I would say, okay, sample n corresponds to the DTFT sample at 2 pi little n over capital N. And then to convert back to this world, I have to multiply by the inverse of this, right? Omega s over 2 pi. So these two pi's cancel out, and I get n omega s over capital N, right? And so this tells me that my corresponding, you know, element on this axis is related to capital N, which is like the length of my DFT, and it's related to omega s, which is my sampling frequency of the original signal. And this conversion is exactly what I used to be able to draw this bottom graph in true units of hertz, right? That tells me how do I draw the, the time axis, or the, I'm sorry, the frequency axis of that lower graph, right? So now we have all the pieces in place, right? So now I feel really good about being able to talk about DFTs, right? And immediately through this chain, go back to what, did that, what does actually correspond to in terms of hertz or radians, assuming that I sampled fast enough, right? And so I think that kind of ties a bow around the whole continuous time, discrete time relationship. Okay, so any questions or comments? All right, great. So in that case, I will see you guys on 